Hello and welcome to Gegen Pressing, the Bundesliga podcast. This is the bonus show, although at this time of the year, everything is a bonus show uh, since we are not doing our regular podcasts. Um, I'm Manu Feit, he's Stefan Wojnkowski. Stefan, how's it going? Yeah, doing very well. Uh, as you said, it's summer, uh, the season's over. This is actually quite a fun part of the year for me because we get to do these kind of silly shows. Well, they're not silly, I guess they're quite serious for certain people, but... Uh, hopefully they're interested enough, but yeah, I had a lot of fun kind of putting together the stats and the research for this art, this, this podcast rather. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's more it's a more relaxed podcast, shall we say? Well, there will be controversy because this is the team of the season podcast. Um, I was kind of scared when you told me that you put together stats. I just threw together a team, but uh, I will have some stats. <laughs> <laughs> well, I. Will have I, to... I... I need stats to explain some of our decisions, so I'll, I'll, I'll just start with that, really. Okay, uh, so that already sounds like a controversial take coming your way. Um, <laughs> if you need stats to make it up. Having said that, I have uh, the excellent transfer mark off the side open, so uh, I will hope to pull out some stats uh, for, for some of um, so for some of my takes. Um, I have also have honorable mentions because I had a tough time getting 11 players together um so <laughs> it's difficult it's really difficult so i apologize to every every player that's being left out here um shall we jump into this and i think we're going to do this by positions um obviously starting with the goalkeepers and um well hold I'm, on before before we start this... sh- before we start should we, d- yeah. should we discuss what formations we've gone for sure Let's do that. Uh, what's just, your formation? Just, just before we get into like the positions, just so that the, the listeners and the viewers can figure yeah. out. So I've I've gone for four Absolutely. three three. Uh, yeah, I've gone four three three. Mm-hmm. Are you four three three, or are you going something else? I'm a four three three. I'll do um, one of the players. I put in my back four. Could also play in midfield. So I guess this is four three 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 four three. If that makes sense. Is this is your team going to be one of these dreadful things you see the ex players and pundits put together for the newspapers where they have like two central defenders, no, four no. central midfielders, three wingers, no. and all sorts of no. nonsense? Okay, it's not that bad. So it's a team. <laughs> it's it's a team that could actually play together. Yes. Okay, that's I, fine. I, I did go for an actual team. Um, yes. Although they, yeah. All right. So yeah, it's a four three three. Um. I just think a couple of the players could also play in a different positions, which made it really difficult, right? And maybe me also coping, copping out on like putting in one more player than <laughs> I wanted to. Um, but yeah, let's let's maybe start with the goalkeeper then. And I I suspect we have the same player here. Um, so should I just say I picked Gregor Kubel? Um, I wonder if you got someone else. No, uh, this probably yeah. is probably the very simple, straightforward position to kick things off. Um, yeah, I think I can speak for both of us when I say I think Cobell's probably head and shoulders above most of the goalkeepers in the division this season. Yeah. Maybe one or two honourable mentions, um, but yeah, by and large, uh, the best shot stopper. Obviously, Manuel Neuer missing much this season at Bayern uh, doesn't help with that. Uh, and then, of course, Bayern signing one of the other best goalkeepers in the division and dropping him into a dysfunctional team. So the main contenders for this position really weren't didn't have much going for them this season. And yeah, I mean, like, Cobell kind of speaks to himself, but I think it's also maybe worth pointing now. We've been saying this on the show for much of the season uh, that, you know, Cobell's been pound for pound maybe Dortmund's best player this season. You know, it's hard to kind of way up a, a goalkeeper's contributions compared to, you know, like a attack midfielder or a striker or whatever else. But I think he's saved them as many points as just about any player in that team has won them points. So, yeah, I think comfortably the best goalkeeper in, in the Bundesliga this season. Yeah, uh, I mean, this is probably the least controversial uh, take that we are going to have today. Um You know, you, you look at it as his, his performance, his stats, 11 clean sheets, right? Um, he was the goalkeeper when he was, I think for me, the big thing was when he was missing and how much that, that meant in drop off of performance. And that's always like a really interesting, um, like what happens when you take a player out of a team, right? And what does that leave the team with? And I think with him, you could really tell 
I, I suspect that Dortmund would have beaten Chelsea with Kubel and goal. Um, you know, that's like that's one big one, and maybe maybe more would have won the title um, if he had been fit the entire year. So, yeah, I I think we don't need to dwell on that one for too long, um, unless uh, there's anything you want to add to Gregor Kubel. No, let's get to the controversial decisions. Okay. <laughs> Let's do that. Uh, be, because we both have a 4 3 3 formation. Shall we do the two wing backs first? Yes. Okay. Well, one at a time, one at a time. So pick right or left back first. Um, so I went with Rafael Guerrero as left back. Okay. Um, so I made a decision not to pick Guerrero at left back because I think he spent half the season playing in central midfield. So uh, I kind of thought. Uh, it's a bit of a kind of it's hard it's hard to kind of th- break down his stats and stuff uh, because you know half the assists he got were obviously from midfield but um, maybe controversial but I actually went for Bor- Borna Sosa here um, you know I know he was in a team that was relegation um, well you know on the cusp of relegation until they played Hamburg and you could definitely make the point that defensively stuck out all over the place this season but his attacking stats were really, really impressive again. And I know that's only half the job of a fullback, but in this sense, I'm kind of going to lead on his attacking sense, st- stats. And according to Opta, he was first for uh, total successful crosses amongst left backs. So, no other left back made more crosses and found one of his teammates in the box. He was first for key passes amongst left backs. So, that's a pass that leads to a shot. Uh, second for assists. And sixth for successful dribbles. So, you know, I think there's obviously a few, you know, uh, mid-game factors here. Obviously, you know, Alfonso Davies not having a full season or even having a strong season at Bayern kind of leaves this field open to other contenders. And the fact that Angelino was kind of chucked out of Leipzig and then they brought in David Rahm, it didn't really work out. Also means like maybe second or third contenders were also kind of pushed to one side here. So... I think in a normal season, Born of Sosa would have probably been replaced by someone who's a little more defensively solid. But um, yeah, there weren't a huge amount of options there. So I've gone for Sosa. Yeah, that's a really good shout. I mean, he was tremendous in the relegation playoffs too. Um, so like came up big in two games that were, I mean, the club, his club had to survive. <laughs> Um, so like that's clutch performance, right? It's a really good shout. Um, and, and you know, good news for Stuttgart fans because it sounds like he wants to stay. Um, but yeah, I can I can definitely appreciate um, your choice there. Um, I think probably a lot less controversial than many expected. Um, so yeah, good shout. So what about the right back then? This one's probably is more controversial. I've actually gone for Mitchell Weiser here. Oh, um, that is controversial. And it wasn't who I initially thought of when, you know, I was kind of putting this together in my head and then I started looking through the stats and, you know, Vice has had a really impressive season. You know, I think it's probably easy to for, kind of overlook a lot of players who play in mid-table clubs um, and especially Mitchell Weiser who has a reputation for being a player who had all the potential in the world but kind of floundered it, whatever you want to call it. Um, I didn't quite live up to that potential, but he was just fantastic for Bremen this season. You know, amongst right backs in the division, and again, this is using all the stats for total uh, stats over the course of the season. Uh, he was first for assists amongst right backs, second for key passes, first for successful crosses, and second for successful dribbles. So he's basically going toe to toe there with like Jeremy Frimpong, for example, who's. Many would probably say his head and shoulders the best kind of right wing back, but I then kind of looked at his defensive stats as well, and he was second for tackles one amongst right backs, second for ground duels one, uh, first for recoveries, seventh for interceptions, you know, so we're talking about a player here who, um, you know, we've talked about Bremen quite a lot this season, how hot and cold they've been, um, but also how impressive they've been in terms of scoring goals, and I think Weiser has been a really integral part of that in fact we talked about this on the um, transfer show actually in the sense that you know Naby Keita coming into that team maybe adds another kind of avenue for them creating goals because they relied so much on 
um, you know, either full crew getting a cross into the box or maybe his second striker laying a ball off to him. And I think Weiser was key to that. So it wasn't uh, someone I thought I'd be picking for the team of the year, but looking at his stats and considering everything he's done for Bremen, uh, I think he's I think he's quite deserving of it, to be honest. Yeah, I picked Jeremy Frimpong. Um, <laughs> the guy was second and success at first in successful dribbles with 88. Um, I just think he adds such a an incredible uh, dimension to this Leverkusen side. And we have to remember, too, Leverkusen didn't start well to this season, and yet his numbers were still still very impressive, right? Um, and I think, obviously, it's going to be fascinating to see what's going to happen with him this summer, um, whether Leverkusen will sell him or not. But I I always do one thing that I don't understand with Frimpong is how he's not the, the, the Dutch national team, uh, because... <laughs> You know, I don't see very many better right backs out there. Maybe this team is a little bit too one dimensional. Um, that that's maybe one thing that you could criticize him for. He's also one of the fastest players in the Bundesliga, right? Um, so maybe they seem a little bit too one dimensional. But like Jeremy Frimpong was for me um, the best right back in the Bundesliga over the course of the entire season. Um, I do think Weiser is an interesting shout though, and I, I think one thing to keep an eye on here is uh, whether he's actually ever going to be called up to the Algerian national team, right? Because that's been something that gets rumored about um, quite a bit. He has been outspoken about this himself. Um, I think his mother is Algerian, right? So, yeah. Something to keep an eye on. Uh, so, that covers our fullbacks, uh, center backs. Well, why don't you go both first? Because I, I did the uh, both did the of them or just one of them. Yeah, just do both. <laughs> okay, I went for Josko Guardiola. I think that speaks for itself. Uh, there's not much controversy here. And then I went for Matthias Ginter. Ah, um, as, I did the exact as, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I guess it's not quite as controversial as I thought. Um, no. Again, for me. The big thing with Matthias Ginter, I seen him seen him live when I was in Freiburg, right when I wrote my feature. Um, his the season that Freiburg had was impressive. Um, and you take a player out of one team, which is Gladbach, and you put him into another team, and you see kind of where they have diverged since. Um, Ginter has made this Freiburg team a lot better, not just a little bit, a lot better. I mean, this is a team that until match day thirty four was in the running. Um, to be uh, in the Champions League, right? And I think Ginter is one of those center backs who gets widely criticized in Germany. Um, probably something that dates back to his time in Dortmund. And I don't always see the reason for this criticism because I do actually think he's one of Germany's best center backs. He is stable. He's nothing fancy, but he'll get the job done, right? And he provides a t- ton of leadership. Could I provide a theory as to why he gets a lot of kind of unfair criticism? This, it, this is look. He looks like yeah, a baby. He's, <laughs> yeah, he's got a ba- he's got a baby face, and it's. It, I know it sounds so rudimentary and so, um, you know, ridiculous, but I think a lot of people look at him and think he's quite a soft looking guy. They don't think you think he's a pushover. They think he's not very physical, but you know, he was third uh, in the Bundesliga this season for aerial duels one. So we're talking about a guy here who knows how to win a header. I mean, he knows how to wrestle a striker out of the way. Uh, and I completely agree with you. He's always been good with the ball at his feet. He's always been a very tidy player. Um, you know, obviously, in his uh, early in his career, he also played as a defense midfielder as well. Um, and yeah, I think he's he's done a really tr- solid transition to Freiburg. And yeah, I mean, Josko Guardiol kind of speaks for himself. I don't actually think he had as good a season this year as he did last year. You know, injury maybe played a part in that as well. But... I think it's also quite telling that we both came to the same conclusion because I kind of went through all the central defenders this season and I thought to myself, it's not a great selection. You know, um, looking across just about all of Dortmund and Bayern's t- squads, uh, struggling to really pick anyone out of either squad who's kind of covered himself in glory. Maybe, I was maybe tempted to go with Mats Hummels just because of the way he's kind of managed to fill in uh, and cover for the kind of Schlotterbeck and... Uh, Nick, uh, Nicholas Sula show that didn't uh, they kind of went up in flames um, but yeah you know Sula, Schlotterbeck, Open Meccano uh, De Ligt kind of had a s- sticky start, obviously Hernandez has been injured, Benjamin Pavard's been a bit of a mess you know just about every high profile defender in the division um, has struggled except for Guardiola uh, and obviously Matthias Ginter 
was tempted to go with Orban as well alongside Guardiol, but um, because they've had a really good partnership there. But yeah, I think Ginter deserves it. I think he's had a great season. Yeah, that's when I, one of my honorable shots come in. Uh, Willy Orban, right? Um, was out of that top five of uh, aerial duels, won with 186. Um, was tremendous in the DFB Pokal final for, for Leipzig. I had a really, really good game um, without Guardiola, right? And I, I do think that Willy Orban often gets overlooked. Um, and I also think it's actually quite a loss for Germany that he picked Hungary to represent rather than Germany, right? Because I think Willy Orban is is a very, very good center back. Um, and he des- he deserves a shout out here. Okay, well, that's the back four done. Um, it's a lot less controversial than I thought. Shall we move thought, to midfield then? I thought my fullbacks were going to be quite controversial. I guess we can ask the listeners and see what they think in the comments below. But yeah, I thought I thought I'd get. I have no problem with your selection. For, for All right, well that's just because you're a nice guy. <laughs> no, well, but like Bonas, like I picked some, I picked different players, right? But like I think Bonas Sosa makes a ton of sense. Like I, I can see why you did it. I, I can say the same with Mitchell Weiser. Um, I mean, in the end of the day, um, these are different selections, but. I can totally, I can totally get along with it. All right. Uh, so the the middle three then. Hmm. Uh, should um, we go? Do, do, I should we go with defense midfielder first? Do you have a mid defense midfielder? Yeah, I I guess I picked one who can play there. <laughs> <laughs> it might be the same one as me, but let's, let's see how it goes. Who did you uh, go for? I went for Jude Bellingham. Okay, not a defense midfielder, but that's no, fine. No, I don't have a full on. I don't have a full on defensive midfielder in my squad. Um, okay, which is, is is going to make this team look very tricky. Um, but yes, I went. I put Jude Bellingham in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've also got Bellingham. He's like I've kind of gone for defense midfielder, a number eight, a number ten. But yeah, we can go Who? with Bellingham. Let's talk about Bellingham because we both have him in our midfield trio. Yeah. Then, so, um, I mean, he is. Just went for 103 plus 30 million euros to Real Madrid. He's a 19 year old. Um, he carried the Dortmund team at times um, on his shoulders. Um, I guess maybe Dortmund would have won that final match against Mainz if he had been fit. Um, he, I did think he dropped off a little bit in the second half of the season, but we all know that he had had knee problems, a knee problem that may require surgery, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, he was, he was tremendous. Um, and, and the, it's, it's really hard, I think, to argue, um, or pick a team that doesn't include him. Yeah, no, I completely agree. When I was kind of thinking about number eights, so there were some other players that maybe could have squeezed into this midfield trio. We can kind of talk about honorable mentions, maybe once we get through them all, but yeah, in terms of like a box to box presence, I think Bellingham's probably one of the best in the division. Uh, it was first for dribbles amongst defenders. Uh, sorry, midfielders this season, fourth for shots on target, third for accurate passes to the final third. So, you know, I kind of wrote a piece for Transfer Mark down actually this uh, week as to, you know, how he kind of transformed over the course of his three, three, three seasons at Dortmund. And the really interesting thing is that he was kind of dropped into that team as kind of like a jack of all trades. And then at times he was asked to play as a defense midfielder. But over the course of these three seasons, we've really seen him kind of develop into attacking player. And this season in particular, where he's actually kind of, his assists are actually kind of down uh, compared to the last couple of years, but his goals are right up there. Shots on target, you know, through the roof. I think I saw some, i trying to remember the crazy stat. I think like his shots on target over the course of three seasons have gone up by like 200% or something compared to his first season and his third. So he's obviously kind of, to the, to the point actually, that I think you could probably argue in the future he's going to be a number 10, even though I've picked him as a kind of box-to-box player here. So yeah, definitely deserving and... You know, that's exactly why Real Madrid have spent so much money on him. Yeah, they're, they're paying it for a promise, right? Because he's I don't think he's far from being a finished product. Okay, so you said you picked a full-on defensive midfielder. Um, I do have an honorable mention. He didn't make it in my team, and that's uh, Scary from Köln, um, who would, would be that defensive midfielder. But who's yours? Well, I've gone for Yosha Kimmich. Um, oh, just Interesting. D- 
just to keep Hansi Flick happy. Um, <laughs> if, the, <laughs> if the press conferences this week are anything to go by, um, well, well, Yasho Kimmich is like Kobe Bryant. Was that the comparison? Yeah, yeah, well, Masada, exactly. Like... Yeah. He, he's mm. definitely the Kobe Bryant of this team for me. Um, no, oh, so man. This, well, then this is actually maybe some interesting context, this because obviously Lothar Mateus said that no one ever gets better around Yasho Kimmich. He doesn't make any the midfielders around him any better. Um, and I think. The interesting thing is that while that's maybe true or not, it's a discussion maybe for another day, his own stats for this season are incredible in terms of defence midfielding. You know, term, amongst midfielders, uh, no one won more tackles. Uh, no one picked up more recoveries. He was second for ground duels won. Uh, fifth for 50-50s won. Fifth for interceptions, you know. So, yeah. You know, there's there's a whole there's a whole discussion about whether Kimmich should be playing further forward and whether Barnes should be signing a defence midfielder, uh, and you know what Kimmich's role in the German national team is. I totally get that, but in terms of what he was tasked with doing, which was basically sitting at the base of that Bayern midfield for the whole season, um, I think he did it better than just about anyone else in the Bundesliga. Um, so yeah, that's why I've put him in as my defence midfielder number six, whatever you want to call it. Mm. Yeah, I was toying with it, but I think for me, the, the big issue with Joshua Kimmich is that I feel like he could have had a better season. Um, and then, I mean, as a German, I'm very jaded by the World Cup experience. Um, you know, that uh, I see tremendous talent in this Germany team, but I don't see it being translated on the field. Uh, and and I think Kimmich is one of those players um, that really need to step step it up um, to make this entire generation of players be better. And maybe that's where my jadedness comes from about not selecting him. But I mean, you're right. Like his numbers, when you actually look at his actual numbers, he is he's very much uh, deserving of being picked there. And I think for me, I, I really want to see the next step. Um, and I almost wonder if that next step has to be away from Bayern. Um, you know, yeah. So, well, we'll see. I guess. I mean, I think, I think that's a really interesting point. I think it's a really important point. Know that a lot of people who do kind of follow Kimmich week to week also fall for the German national team, and you know, the two different players playing maybe two different roles in two very different teams right now. Obviously, you know, um, and I think a lot of the kind of discussion and debate over him is that he hasn't really stepped into the role of leader per se um so i think that's definitely an argument and it's a very fair argument to me that he should be kind of doing more than just the defensive work but um luckily for me i've picked some uh attacking players but you've only given me one midfielder thing so far so who's your second one uh jamal musiala um will, will i put I, I see him as a eight ten. um i think in the future and I mean, he led all midfielders by goals and assists. Um, he was one of the most productive players in the Bundesliga period. I think he led all all top four leagues with goals and assists as well this year um, when it comes to U20 players. I mean, he's up there in discussion with Jude Bellingham. Um, in fact, I have his jersey right behind me, as you can see. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, I think Jamal Musiala is is a tremendous player, and you can't you cannot have him in any team of the season. I think um, I think for him, it's going to be really interesting to see what's going to happen next in his development. Um, I think his his ceiling is tremendously high, um, but I think what he needs to nail down is a position. You know, he needs to very much... And I, I think that's that you, you could make in some ways the same argument with Bellingham and, um, you know, that where is this, where is he actually best on the field? And at some point, he needs to nail down a position both for Bayern and Germany and make that position his. And um, I know he feels he looks like Bambi and he's like, you know, he makes a very young impression, but this is a very smart kid. Uh, and I think he will have to also assume a little bit of leadership here as well. Similar to what Thomas Müller did at the same age, right? Um, but yeah, Jamal Musiala, I think um, it's hard to, to not include him in a team of the season. Yeah. Well, my third midfielder is a kind of contemporary of his, maybe a potential rival in terms of the national team and, of course, the Bundesliga. 
And there's also maybe another uh, controversial choice uh, from me. Uh, and I've actually gone for Florian Verts as my number 10. Now, we all know that Verts missed half the season, but he also played half the season. And I think that's just about the cutoff. Uh, he played 17 of the 34 games. Uh, so I think he's okay. And I actually think his stats also kind of really speak for themselves in the sense, um, you know, in terms of the fact, despite the fact he missed half the season, he was still fourth in the Bundesliga for key passes, second for through balls, sixth for successful dribbles. So he completed more dribbles than every midfielder in the division except for five, despite the fact that he missed half the season. Uh, and if you kind of break it down per 90, it was third for key uh, for deep completion passes, which are passes into like the six-yard box, uh, and second uh, for through balling. I maybe already said that. So... I completely understand if people are maybe listening to this thinking you can't really pick a player who's missed half the season, but I just feel like number one, the amount of the amount he managed to do in the second half of the season, in the manner in which he managed to outpace people who had already played the first half of the season, and to do so by truly galvanizing that Leverkusen side to the point that we we all thought they might begin to a Europa League final, they might be kind of making a late push for the top four. Um very quickly re-established himself as not only the main man at Leverkusen, but confirmed that that nasty injury hadn't really set him back in terms of his potential, in terms of his ceiling. Still this extremely talented young player. So maybe I'm being a bit cheeky here by including him in, but I think he just about squeezed it in terms of the total minutes he played. So, uh, And I think he did so much in those minutes that he deserves to be in his team. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to argue against that, I think. Um, I mean, Florian Wirtz is another example of what happens when you put a player back into a squad, right? Um, and I actually toyed um, with putting him in there. Um, I went a little bit of a different direction. And I guess this is where um, you have to look at Guerrero and where, where I put him. Um, and, you know, moving him up and down the field. Because my third midfielder is actually Kingsley Coman. Um, which you know makes this look more like a a three four three, I guess. Um, if you if you include him, um, for me Kingsley Coman again, he didn't he didn't play a full season either, just twenty four games. But in those twenty four games, he had eight goals and six assists. And you know what? What and I I wrote a full article on this. His defensive stats um this year, on top of that, have been very very impressive. He's the sort of player that. He does everything weirdly well on both sides of the pitch. Um, and I think a two-way forward. Right? A forward who is both effective in the attack, but also can has a significant defensive uh, contribution. It comes from hockey or ice hockey, uh, to use the UK term, um, where where you always have one or two players in your squad that um, you know, when when you have to be defensive, um, defensively minded, it's usually a forward with very good plus minus stats, um, and it's usually a winger. So <laughs> Kingsley Coman fits both those attributes quite well. And um, you know, I I just had a hard time not including him. Um, I think he is. What I think also has really been great. You had a sense this year that with Kingsley Coman, he's now doing interviews in full German, right? Um, he's he's very much wearing that Bayern Munich uh, crest like it's tattooed on his chest. And this is a player who's been linked away from move year after year after year. And every year he's sort of renewed his commitment. And I I would actually argue that if Bayern Munich had more, player, had more players like him, we wouldn't even talk about a crisis right now because he does, he does really have a very strong mentality. So yeah, I found I had a really hard time not having squad and you know i guess um push come to shove a guerrero can move into that number six role um <laughs> and make this make the side uh defensively sound yeah we'll we'll figure out some sort of formation to make it work um yeah. <laughs> but you know coleman's coleman's a great show and you make a really good point about how much Bayern missed him this season you compare yeah. them to like someone like serge Gnabry, who's been about for most of the season but has kind of struggled to really impose himself uh, not to mention guys like Sadio Mane or you know any other kind of forward in that team, uh, Leroy Sani as well, perhaps as well. So yeah, yeah. Coman definitely's missed their consistency at Bayern, and they've really missed it. So that's no, a fair shout, very fair shout. Yeah, 
All right. Well, that covers our defense and midfield, right? Um, uh, we both have three strikers. Um, and I guess in this case, our strikers are also wingers um, or can play on the wing. I suspect we have a lot of overlap here. Um, how do you want to do this, Stefan? Um, well, let's pick the two wide positions and we can finish with a striker then. Sounds great. So my two wide positions are Ragnar Kolumwani and Christopher Nkunku. Um, okay. Really easy picks. <laughs> you know, because like, I don't, I personally don't see Kolumwani. You could make an argument that Kolumwani is a center forward like, and a typical number nine. I don't see that. Um, I I see him as a wide player. Um, and I, I mean, and Kunku, same thing, right? Um, you know, he does play off the shoulder. He's very effective with doing that. You could even, you know, I I wrote an article really early on in the year when I went to Leipzig and watched him, where you could say he even drops into the that, that number ten role at times, right? Um, he's very effective at playing between the lines, but he's certainly not a number number nine. Um, but yeah, I think those two. Um, I mean, it's so hard. To, it would be almost impossible to leave either one out of the side, unless you did, unless you found someone else. <laughs> I did actually. Um, so I've, um, as you know, my notice is I hadn't picked Jamal Musiala yet in my team, and so Florian Verts taking a number ten spot meant I had to find another spot for Jamal Musiala, and I've put him on the left wing. You can definitely argue he's playing more of an inside uh, forward role if you want. Uh, and actually, if you kind of look at his heat map um, over the course of the season, he does kind of usually sit in that kind of left-hand side pocket. Um, whether that's as an A or a 10, whatever you want to call it, doesn't really matter. But yeah, you've already talked about Musiala. He was outstanding for this season. I think um, he was almost like a victim of his own success in the sense that you could see he was a bit there's a there's serious burnout, I think, after the first half of the season, which Bayern heavily relied upon him. And then obviously the World Cup and everything that came from that. And then he got back from that and you could tell that he was a little jaded. So, um, But despite that, obviously he still finished 25 goals and assists. Absolutely incredible. First for successful dribbles. First for goals and assists amongst wingers and attack midfielders. Second for goals. Blah, blah, blah. You know, he's just he's just incredible. I think I actually I remember tweeting actually before the, the Classico when I was getting the train to the Allianz Arena. Um and I actually quickly looked up his stats and he was basically first for just about every attacking metric at Bayern Munich. So I'm sure that's kind of changed a wee bit since then, but that just kind of goes to show how important he is. Um, so he's the obvious one. On the right wing, I've actually gone for maybe another kind of outside-the-box one, and I've gone with Jonas Hoffman, actually, at, uh, at Gladbach, who no one seems to have noticed has actually finished the season with 22 goals and assists in the Bundesliga this season which is equal to Christoph, Christopher Nkunku um, first for key passes sixth for through balls and you know Gladbach have been an absolute dumpster fire of a club this season you know they sacked Daniel Fark uh, and you know players want to leave star players aren't bothering to play because they know they're leaving in the summer they brought players in who are you know, struggling to kind of embed themselves it's been a real mess for a club, but for Hoffman to get through that season with the same goals and assists as Christopher Nkunku, only one player has more, um, I just thought it was remarkable. And, you know, if you kind of want to go pound for pound in terms of which right winger in the Bundesliga put the put the points on the on the table or whatever you want to call it, or put the, put the goals and assists on the charts, then Hoffman did as well as anyone there, uh, unless you kind of want to move Kolomolani to the right wing, which I haven't done. Um, so yeah, I think Hoffman's deserving of this kind of team this season because I think not only does he match just about every forward, but he did it in a really bad Gladbach team, uh, yeah. which I think is even more impressive. And he's a German national team player, right? Um, he's really carved out a role there too, uh, funnily enough, as a wing back or full back. Um, yeah, it's a, I think it's a tremendous shout. I mean, despite Gladbach's poor season, he, he does, does get the call up for Germany on a very regular basis and it's probably going to feature against Poland on, on Friday. Um, final thought, I'm glad you brought up Musiala again because um, I had a thought on that I, I kind of missed on. He won Bayern Munich the title of that goal um, on match day 34, which will guarantee a spot in the Bayern Munich Museum 
it will 100% guarantee a spot in the Bayern Music Museum because it was such an emotional title win in the end, right? With that needing that final goal at the very end. And it was such a tremendous goal. And I actually wonder if that is the goal that will define the rest of his career. Because remember that moment in, in Qatar where he he broke through in the box. Um, it was against Japan and he put the ball over the bar and then Japan came back and won that game 2-1. We all know Musiala finishes that. Germany win that game, and you know we don't know what happens after that. But um, it, it felt, almost felt like because his numbers have been so tremendous, it felt like he needed a clutch goal like that just to know that he can do it. And I wonder what this goal will do for the rest of his career because he's, he's only twenty. But um, I think that was such an incredible moment, and the fact that his goal essentially finished up this season. Um, I think that is something that needs to be mentioned here. Anyways, my final thought on Musiala. Um, but it's okay. Who's your number nine? Well, I've gone for Colin Moani uh, as the number nine. Um, I was very close to going, going with uh, Phil Krug because I think if you kind of look at who was the most consistent or the most efficient goal scorer in the Bundesliga who played enough games... I think the Bremen striker maybe beats Colomani in terms of that. But what Colomani brings to the game is obviously his assist as well. 15 goals and 14 assists is simply outrageous. You know, four more than just about, than anyone else in the league. Um, Frankfurt had a very hot and cold season. Almost won the cup. Almost did something in the Champions League. Almost, you know, top six, whatever. So the, I guess in a sense... I mean, I was, I, in fact, I was going to say they maybe had a disappointing season. I don't think I'd go that far just because I know Frankfurt fans just be happy that they're in the top half at this moment in time. But um, Cole Lani definitely kind of carried that team at times. He definitely pulled them out of a lot of fires. He And, and the manner in which he scores and creates goals is just really impressive. Still not entirely sure we should be calling him a central forward. Um, yeah, that but... was my issue. I think that was my issue as well. Like, yeah. Is he a center forward? Like, what is his best position like? Yeah, but then the issue is that it was between him and Nkunku for me in terms of playing that number nine role because, you know, basically where Nkunku has played for much of the season and I thought, well, I can't pick Nkunku over Kolmani because Kolmani's basically done everything he has and then, um, you know, but with more goals and assists. If it was an overall German football thing, then maybe because Nkunku obviously won the, uh, the Pokal, but if we're basing it purely on the Bundesliga, then, yeah, I think Kolmani deserved to lead that line and he's done it. He's had an outstanding season. So Kolomwani makes both our teams. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned Phil Cook there because he is my number nine. Um, I think he is a player that... I think he actually still has a few years in him too because remember he did his ACL twice. Um, so he missed, what, two and a half to three years just with injuries. So really he's only 27, not 30. Um <laughs> I think the biological age of strikers is just different anyways these days. You see a lot of strikers really coming into their best um, at around 30 at the moment, right? Um, so I think this is a player that actually still has a lot of lifespan in him. But um, what, ex what a season he had. And not just for Bremen, but also for Germany. He's one of the very few players that came out of that World Cup actually looking like, you know, this World Cup worked really well for him. Um, scored seven goals in seven games for Germany in his still very short national team career. Um, but, you know, there, there is a reason too why why Werder Bremen are doing everything in their power to keep him, but including signing players that can make him better, right? And Nabi Keita. And his 16 goals is enough to be tied um, for the Torjiga Kanone. Um, he shares that with Christopher and Kunke in Germany. If two strikers have the same amount of goals, they share it. There's no tiebreaker. Um and I think other leagues have like a tiebreaker, like an assist. I think the FIFA World Cup, if, if two are the same, then I think they won more assists when it. That's how Thomas Müller won it in 2010, I believe. Um, but, you know, he's just has just had a tremendous year and it's almost like leads the line of the resurgence of the number nines. You know who I almost put there too? Um, it's Chupo Moting. I think he, wow. he, he, was an honor, he was an honorable mention for me. Hmm. Um, Bayern Munich were significantly worse when he wasn't on the side. Yeah, definitely. No, it's, it's actually a very good point. I think, I think the only thing that put me off Chopamo thing is he just simply didn't score as many goals as the other teams. Yep. But that's what I, I guess for me too. Yeah, obviously the last kind of six, seven, eight weeks of the season kind of put put a you know a pin in that for him. But 
No, that's really interesting. It's quite remarkable that we both end up picking Werder Bremen players. I don't, I, I don't think we would have expected that, but... It's that first they... half of the season, right? It was so good. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, should we um, should we discuss some honourable mentions before we wrap this up then? Yeah, so I mean, we mentioned a few already. I had, uh, so my honourable mentions were Eric Maxim Schopenhauer, who I mentioned. I, I mentioned Elias Shakiri, um, who I think is going to go for a lot of money to a big club this summer. Um, Mark Flecken was my other goalkeeper. Um, Willy Orban, I mentioned. And um, Konrad Leimer was another mentioned in there. Uh, and I had Sebastian Haller in there as well as an honorable mention just not enough games for me um at the very highest level to make that team it would have been like oh such a great story kind of pick but you know that's why i had him in consideration yeah the only two that when it oh gosh i could probably rhyme off but a half a dozen you know guys like Gerardo becker maybe musa diaby but the two ones that kind of stand out for me um, Vincenzo Grifo, who had a really, really great season with Freiburg, um, kind of led the line along um, as a winger. He got a great amount of goals and assists for them, and he just did what he always does, you know, just a kind of very reliable Bundesliga player. But the other one who I was desperately trying to fit the team, I just couldn't, was Julian Brandt, who, you know, um, Jude Bellingham's obviously going to get all the headlines because he's made the big move, and, you know, there'll be other players who maybe... Um, get more of the plaudits, you know, I just met what well, we talked about one in Gregor Kobel, but if there's one player that I think that team desperately relied on in terms of attacking sense, I actually think probably relied on more than uh, Jude Bellingham, which is why I almost put him in instead of Bellingham, is Brandt, who, you know, 17 goals and assists, and he was just a player who picked the, he was just a player who kind of threaded the, threaded the passes, he pulled the strings, whatever you want to call it, he was the guy who kind of gave that Dortmund team life, you know, and I'm really hoping he can kind of use that to kind of have another good season because we've been kind of waiting for Brandt to kind of show up and be this kind of Meza Ozil type mercurial number 10. And when he was on form for Dortmund this season, he was absolutely incredible. Um, so I feel bad that he wasn't in my team. Um, but yeah, so he gets an honorable mention. Yeah, it's, it's really difficult. Um, with some of these with these players, especially when you look at their stats um, on who to put in, what to leave out. And that, that's what I said at the top of the show, right? Um, sometimes there is no no right or wrong answer here. Um, it really is about, you know, what sometimes also what we perceive. Like, right, we can back it up with stats, but sometimes it's also just about what you perceive over the course of a season um, was impactful. So, yeah, here we are. Uh, we'll definitely post these in the chat. Uh, I know you have a chat on Substack open, uh, so we're going to post these in the chat. And you guys can do whatever you want with these. Uh, take them apart, criticize them, uh, call us frauds, whatever you want. <laughs> um, just remember, this isn't Twitter. It's Substack. So, <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, we'll definitely... Obviously, you know, um, ask people for their thoughts, and some people have started putting them into the thread, but also... You know, obviously, leave your comments below as to what you thought about individual picks or who we missed out or who we, you're glad we included uh, in the comments below the article as well. Um, and we can have a good conversation about it there as well. Absolutely. Anyways, uh, I think we're doing Coach of the Season next year, next week. Not next year, next week. Uh, so, so stay tuned. Um, and I guess we will be back next week. Make sure to read Stefan's rant on why you should be watching the Bundesliga. And uh, read my piece on why Hamburg will never get promoted to the Bundesliga again. Um, both of these are up on our uh, Substack, so check that out. And yeah, we'll talk to you guys next week. Until then, auf Wiedersehen. <laughs>